Well, hello. Thank you for joining me. This is a sermon on Luke 18, verses 1 through 8. It is the appointed lectionary text for the 19th Sunday after Pentecost. This year that falls on October 16th, 2022. As is our custom, we'll begin with a reading of the lesson. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice, so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? This is the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, people of God, grace to you and peace from God our Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ, in his one precious Holy Spirit. Amen. As you are probably aware, we have entered confirmation season in the Tomorrow River Lutheran Parish. Now, during the first year of the pandemic, it seemed unwise to us, and I'm sure the county would have had things to say, too, if we had stuffed the church with 200-plus people and done a traditional Confirmation Sunday. So our solution was to spread out the class over multiple services and multiple weeks. Each service we did would have one kid affirming their baptismal covenant, confirming their faith, and being received as a full confirmed member of the community. And as it turned out, families liked the new system. They liked it better. Each kid got their own special day. There were no comparisons between the kids, and no one felt bad that they had fewer family members show up to support them than some other kid had. So now, when most of us would feel absolutely fine gathering with a large group, the new tradition just refuses to be cast aside. I'm not saying that we're never going to go back to the old way, but I'm saying it won't be this year. And next year is not looking too good either. For at least the immediate future, we are not going to be having confirmation days. We're going to be having confirmation seasons. And there are benefits to us, too. A season of baptismal affirmations and faith statements can only be helpful to those of us who are a bit further down the road. A season of remembering the promises that are to shape our lives and guide our community, well, that can only be helpful, too. We gather today as Lutheran Christians, remembering that we are both saved and adopted into the family of God in our baptisms, and we affirm again with all of our Lutheran brothers and sisters over the last 505 years that we are justified by grace through faith in Christ Jesus for good works. And here's something fun. While we spend most of our time talking about justification, responding to the writings of the Apostle Paul, or to Luther's catechism, by happy accident, we get to hear Jesus talk about justification both this week and next week. And that's a little bit rare. It's not where our Lord spends most of his time. So it's an extra grace for all of us in this confirmation season. In our lesson today, Jesus not only gives us a memorable parable about a widow being justified, he also does us the great service of telling us what we're going to hear and then what it means. There are certainly weeks when we miss the point. Weeks when my preaching isn't quite up to snuff or your listening leaves something to be desired. But this week, no excuses. Right up front. We're informed by Jesus that this is a parable about our need to pray always and not lose heart. And it's good that we get that sentence from Jesus, because if I gave it to you, my guess is that you'd want to argue with me about it. There are at least three parts of Jesus' introductory sentence that seem wrong to us. First, and let's be candid, we don't think that we need to pray. We think prayer is a good thing, might even be an important thing, but not a necessary thing. We need to breathe, we need to eat, 
we need to sleep. Bad things happen if we don't do those things. But prayer? How could prayer possibly be considered necessary? And it's pretty clear here that Jesus doesn't think it's necessary for God that we pray. God doesn't need us to be praying. Jesus thinks that it's necessary for us. Jesus thinks that we need to pray. And I'm guessing that you would like to argue about that. I invite you to feel free to argue with Jesus, and that's actually a perfectly legitimate kind of prayer. Second, we don't think that we need to pray always. We think tossing a sentence or two heavenward in times of need or trial and getting in a recitation of the Lord's Prayer on, uh, you know, a few of the Sunday mornings at least, should just about keep the tank full. Now, we're aware that there's some prayer athletes in our midst that also pray before every meal and before they go to bed. And there's a few Olympic level prayers in our midst that actually bring the yellow sheets home and say that they spend time with God every day. But for a lot of us, that's a crazy level of commitment, right? So what do we do with Jesus saying that we need to pray always? The temptation, of course, is to substitute a different word, a word like regularly or often, but always is what Jesus says. And however much we argue, that difficult and troubling word always remains. Third, and perhaps most troubling, is this idea that we ought not lose heart. Because that implies a certain amount of waiting, a certain amount of disappointment, and maybe even some suffering. And that's not a flavor that any of us appreciate. We want our prayers to be effective right now. We want God to meet our needs today. We want what we want when we want it because we want it. And the odds are pretty high, if history is any guide, that I may very well lose heart if I don't get what I want when I want it. The odds are pretty high, if history is any guide, that I may very well lose heart if I'm subjected to prolonged disappointment and suffering. So again, what a grace it is that we have this sentence from Jesus and not from any human authority. For without Jesus' endorsement, we would almost certainly skitter away into our own sensibilities and into the darkness of beliefs and practices that don't actually reflect the intentions or will of God. As Jesus says, this parable is given to us to help us remember that we need to pray always and not lose heart. So the parable. In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused. But later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continuing coming. Now, I hear this parable differently now than I did as a younger man. There was a time that I might have imagined, I might even have argued, that unjust judges only operated in different systems, in distant societies. And I have now been thoroughly disabused of those notions. Of course, we have judges who do their work carefully and with integrity. They, share no, they, they show no fear or favoritism in their rulings. Thanks be to God for those careful public servants. Yet scarcely a day passes now when we don't hear stories about the manipulation of our laws and the different standards of justice afforded to different categories of people. It is heartbreaking. And I have no problem imagining a judge who neither fears God nor has any respect for people. Jesus' initial audience, living under their puppet king and their Roman occupiers, would also know about systemic injustice and the difficulty that the poor or the marginalized have, especially in disputes with the rich or educated or privileged or powerful people. They would have been further horrified that it's a widow who's unable to get a fair hearing, much less justice. The Old Testament, the law, and the prophets are nothing but clear that the widow, the orphan, and the resident alien are to be protected. 
that these categories of people are particularly vulnerable persons and they must be given aid and support lest God's judgment fall on the whole people. So you can almost feel Jesus' audience shaking their heads and grinding their teeth as he tells them this parable. It's an encapsulation of everything that's wrong with the world. It's a rejection of everything that God intends. And such characters are so prevalent that no one has any problem imagining the situation that Jesus sketches. Now, it doesn't show up in most English translations, but there's a bit of a joke at the end of Jesus' parable when the wicked judge is explaining to himself why he will finally give this widow justice. There's a word that has its source in boxing. Literally, what the words say in Greek is, I will give her justice so that she won't give me a black eye. Now, there had to be some grim smiles as people imagined this tenacious and fearless widow punching that unjust judge in the face. Because she has a compelling need, because she pesters the judge endlessly, because she doesn't lose heart, she finally gets what she needs from him. And in case we fail to understand Jesus' point, he then explains the parable to us. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. It is so beautiful. It's so hopeful. If an utterly wicked and unfit judge can be compelled to do the right thing, how much more can we depend on God to give justice to God's children? God is the exact opposite of this wicked judge. God is the personification of goodness and grace and tenderness and justice. For God to answer the prayers of the righteous is in perfect conformity with God's own character. That makes it certain. Now, there is one more place where we might falter, and some of us might trip over Jesus' assertion that God will quickly grant justice to God's children, because that seems wrong to some of us. It seems at odds with our lived experience. Some of us have been pestering God for years about a persistent health concern, or a painful relationship, or a family member on a destructive path. Again, it's a place where a careful translation, a fuller translation, can be helpful. The word quickly in the sentence, you know, that he will quickly grant justice to them. That word quickly, it has the sense of suddenly as opposed to something happening soon. God does, of course, reserve the right to fix things right now. But the actual promise of Jesus here is that when God justifies and vindicates God's children, it will come suddenly. Injustice and need and longing will evaporate completely. And of course, that understanding is in keeping with what Jesus said at the start of the parable, that we need to pray always and not lose heart. Victory will come and it will be total. But it might not be soon. And that sense also explains the last sentence of the lesson. Jesus says, and yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? The reconciliation of all things, the answering of all prayers, the fulfillment of every hope may be a long way off. And we are called to cling to God's promises and to practice the ways of the coming kingdom until that great and glorious day comes which is why we need to pray, why we need to pray always, and why we must tell ourselves the truth so that we do not lose heart. But we are not alone. In our baptisms, we were each gifted with the Holy Spirit. From all eternity, God ordained that the Son would come that we might share in Jesus' life. We've been given God's word and faithful examples. We share in the Lord's table, in the Lord's supper, and we for receive forgiveness of all of our sins. And this week, and next week, and the week after that, we're joined by new members who will publicly embrace the promises of their baptisms and the Holy Christian faith. And we will benefit from their questions and from their vitality we pray that they will benefit from our experience and our accumulated wisdom. 
And we pray that all of us together might be the people of God until Jesus returns, suddenly vindicating and fulfilling every promise. We pray all these things. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You be well, my dear friend. It would be good to see you or to hear from you soon. Bye-bye.